Hello, Year 13s. So, at the minute, you're learning about the carbon cycle. And one of the hardest concepts to get your head around when you learn about the carbon cycle is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, also called ENZO. Um, and for the bit of context about it, um, ENZO is the name of my dog. Uh, as a good geography teacher, I named my dog after a weather phenomenon. Yes, indeed. And here's a picture of him. Um, and El Nino is a name that is given to um, that so Southern Oscillation. Because of the time of year, it tends to happen. So a very famous person who was called El Nino was Fernando Torres, who was um, a striker of Liverpool Football Club when I was growing up. M my hero, every time he scored an unbelievable amount of goals, but when he broke through on the international football scene as a Spanish player, he, he was really, really young. And his face always looked really, really, uh, really, really childish in some ways. And so they nicknamed him, nicknamed him the little boy or El Nino. Um, and it's the same thing for the uh, Enzo phenomenon, whereby the weather pattern uh, was picked up. Um, the change in climatic conditions often occurred on the South Pacific, um, South Pacific and um, South American coast. And it was discovered by Peruvian fishermen, and that change always tended to occur around the same time of year, which was December. And in December, we celebrate the birth of a young boy uh, called Jesus. And so they named the uh, weather phenomenon El Nino de Navidad after the fact it always tended to occur around the birth of Christ and around Christmas. Anyway, that's a little historical anecdote as to why El Nino is a phenomenon is called El Nino, linking to one of the world's best football strikers and my dog. But how does it all work? So naturally, um, it's quite a complicated process because it involves both the winds above and the currents below the sea level. Okay, But the key thing to understand is naturally, you can see there, the Pacific current works in this way. It kind of uh, anti-clockwise okay so south current is cold current that brings cold water up near north america um and then it comes back around the equator it warms up and brings warm uh, water over to um southeast asia okay it does so both in terms of like around the sea but also in a process whereby as the winds equatorial winds move warm air and warm water um to the west pacific that warm air and warm water gets replaced by cold water. But the cold water both comes from the south of um, the Pacific and from deep in the ocean in a process we call upwelling. Okay, So you've got basically, you've got a line here of warm water and cold water. And as the trade winds blow the warm water away from um, the South American coastline, it gets replaced by cold water from deeper in the Pacific Ocean and from colder water from the Southern Ocean itself near the Antarctica. Okay, that process is called upwelling. But basically what that does, it means in our normal conditions, we tend to have, um, uh, you've got the, blow, the winds tend to blow what, east to west um, because of the rotation of the earth along the equator. There's upwelling in South America, uh, which means on the whole, we tend to have warm, wetter weather, more humid weather in Southeast Asia. We tend to have drier uh, weather in um in South America. That's in natural conditions. El Nino, La Nina events, uh, La Nina is the opposite to El Nino events. Um, they tend to happen every two to seven years and they can last between nine to 12 months, but there's no rule of thumb about how they happen. El Nino tends to happen more often than La Nina, um, but it's the rule of thumb is it, it's, it's a cycle where it happens again and again and repeats itself, but the length of these always varies, okay? So that's the normal conditions on the, in the Pacific Ocean, world's largest ocean. El Nino events occur when there is um, the weakening of those winds. The winds weaken, therefore the w less warm water and warm air moves towards um, Southeast Asia, which means more warm water and more warm air stays a little bit more stagnant in the tropical areas of the Pacific, okay? So areas of South America become less cold because they get, it doesn't get replaced by cold water through because the upwelling weakens, okay? So basically what ends up happening is you get end up having less um, upwelling and all the warm, moist air stays more central in the Pacific Ocean, okay? And what that basically means is that, that you've got winds and the upwelling that weakens, yet warmer water and the jet streams are pushed east or stay in, uh, in the middle of the Pacific. What that tends to cause is basically is also tends to lead to higher global average temperature so one of the reasons 2022 and 2023 were so hot as well as anthropogenic climate change is the fact that el nino event was causing global temperatures to rise 
So it, it kind of accelerated in some ways uh, the enhanced greenhouse effect. There's also a pattern whereby during El Nino years, temperatures get higher. And as well as that, and because of that in some ways, oh, uh, it's, it's often due or uh, due to higher CO2 levels. You tend to have higher CO2 levels in El Nino years, predominantly because um, it's the, you get more drought conditions in, um, in, in South America um, and in, in, the Southeast, uh, in, in Southeast Asia and um, in some, some parts of South America, like, uh, like Brazil and the Amazon. Therefore, more drought means more plants die and there's less photosynthesis, so less carbon gets absorbed, so there's more carbon in the air. As well as that, during El Nino years, there tend to be years where there's really high levels of wildfires in, in uh, Australian outback. It re releases vast quantities of CO2 in the air, and therefore the El Nino conditions often lead to spiking w w in wildfires in, um, in the West Pacific, especially, especially Australia. Um, whereas in the East Pacific, so thinking uh, Chile, think of Peru, think of uh, uh, um, Ecuador, you tend to have really wet, high level of floods. But obviously the other side of the Man Andes, that changes because of the um, relief, etc. And in the Amazon, you also end up having a bit more drought. But ultimately, global temperatures tend to be warmer during El Nino years. Um, West Pacific specifically tends to be drier, and this tends to be more CO2 in the air. Okay, La Nina is the opposite to El Nino, um, and it's, it means the little girl, obviously, which is opposite to the little boy. Um, and the way I remember it is, it's basically like the normal conditions of the Pacific, just on steroids, and even more intense in terms of upwelling and winds actually strengthen. So you get even more warm water and the, uh, being pushed to the west. The jet stream gets pushed to the west in the Pacific. So you get a global temperature that drops. With temperatures that drop, you get less CO2 in the air. Um, because there's, plants don't die, there's less droughts. It rains more. Plants thrive in some ways, absorb more carbon because there's more photosynthesis, etc. And what it ends up happening, you end up having way more... Uh, uh, stormy, wet weather in the West Pacific often leads to spike in the number of typhoons that hits Southeast Asia and cyclones in the effect in the Indian Ocean. Whereas in the East Pacific, you tend to be much much drier, so you'll end up with some droughts in um, in South America, um, and you'll have fewer hurricanes. Whereas, whereas El Nino years usually lead to more hurricanes in the Pacific Ocean. What it also does is um, you end up having, because you've got more cold water in South American coastline over here, and due to stronger upwelling, more sediment gets pushed upwards in the ocean, which allows phytoplankton to thrive. And phytoplankton are one of the single biggest cause of CO2 being absorbed by our oceans. Because they thrive, they proliferate along the West uh, American coastline. That absorbs a vast quantity of CO2. It makes nutrient-rich waters, which is amazing for fishing. Um, and so it has a massive impact on the local ecosystem. Which is, but that, the kind of upwelling leads to less CO2 because there's more phytoplankton. So more carbon gets absorbed by the atmosphere. Does that make sense? Despite the fact on land it's drier and therefore you might have some crops that die. It's a phytoplankton that have a massive impact. And obviously Southeast Asia, you get more rain, so you get more prone to growth of, um, of biotic factors in an ecosystem. Okay. But anyway, is a, 